Hi, and welcome to AI Time Journal Podcasts. My name is Sindhujan, and I'll be conducting an interview with Michael Dillon. Michael is the founder of Geneva-based Health Bank, the only citizen-owned health data exchange cooperative, and is a chair member of the Strategic Advisory Board of Elemental Machine, a platform that presents large amounts of data onto a user-friendly interface. He's a healthcare strategist and holds an MBA from the Olin School of Business of Washington University. Thank you for taking the time to have this conversation with us. To start things off, why don't you tell us a little bit about your career and educational background? Sure. Thanks for having me on, Santachin. Um, so I have a what you would probably refer to as a, uh, a, a person that sort of did a lot of uh, fence jumping, if you will. Um, I started off as somebody who was very interested in biotechnology and, um, and also, as we talked about uh, prior, uh, anthropology. Um, so humans in general fascinate me. Um, but uh, I, uh, I ended up uh, being uh, pulled into IT back in the early 90s. And I told people I was a developer, then I, I managed people that were developers, then I managed the people that managed the people that were developers. And eventually I found myself uh, thinking, gee, I, I, I see that all the fun in this business uh, happens when you understand a bit more about the business itself. So I decided that it might be a good idea, along with the, the company that I was working for, to run off and get my MBA. And uh, at the end of my MBA, I decided, you know what, um, this has been fantastic. I'd love to start my own business. And the first company that I founded, Intelligent, uh, with uh, a gentleman that I'd worked before, um, great guy. Uh, we just were at the right place at the right time, data centers, telephony, that sort of thing. But I'll say that, you know, I was fascinated with that business and we did it. The, the business was very successful. It, you can't be great timing. But I always had in my head and my friends that I made in business school and other places that were clinicians, I just have a long standing, deep thinking about uh, healthcare. So when I was bought out of that business, I ended up in Switzerland uh, and um, I was very fortuitous to meet some really uh, fantastic people that were running a, a large, one of the largest funds in Switzerland. And I ended up uh, being the chairperson of a, a bioinformatics company based in Geneva called Gene Bio. And it was just a fantastic four-year experience. And it taught me a couple of things. One, I had uh, erroneously thought prior to that, that uh, life sciences and healthcare uh, were uh, very well put together from a data perspective. And boy, was I wrong. I mean, completely wrong. Um, I remember hearing, oh, it's special data. And I thought, what's so special about it? And so we don't have to go into all the, the song and dance, but that really led me to think about how we could democratize health data. And um, myself and a lot of other very talented people came together um, with, in what seems like forever ago back in 2013. Um, we were actually in Zurich and came up with the framework around Health Bank and the idea that not only is it important for people to have access to their own health data and the, have the ability, you know, the provenance of the health data, but really the organization itself should be uh, something that is, that is again, owned by the patients to prevent any, um, any issues with uh, future ownership, if you will. And that, got, that idea has been, um, you know, uh, it's imitations of, I think, a wonderful form of flattery. And so there's been some other things very similar to Health Bank and Health Bank uh, it's just grew like crazy. And then we looked at different ways to commercialize it. I also was an entrepreneur in residence for a early stage life sciences fund in Switzerland. And then I, I took another fence jump and was uh, very fortunate to uh, meet and work with uh, the folks that had developed a very innovative EKG patch uh, a company called Vital Connect. And um, that sort of sent me down the, the path of, hey, you know, there's a lot of different layers to this. There's the collecting the data, there's the exchanging the data, there's the analysis of the health data, and they're all, they're all of equal importance and, and all require innovation. 
Wow, wow. No, that's amazing. I love how you've done so many different things in the fields of healthcare and tech. And you've also like, not only did you like do a lot of entrepreneurship and private uh, level work, but you've also done some pretty massive public level um, healthcare initiatives, um, especially about the health bank. I think North America is not there yet, but we're kind of moving towards letting our citizens and our people um, access their health records through like different modes of technology, like patient reported outcomes, et cetera. But I just want to hear your uh, perspective. Do you see North America as in the United States, Canada, um, adopting a similar concept like the health bank? Or are we still a far, far, far cry away from that? Having a, uh, a publicly owned, if you will, and I don't mean that in the in the, the shareholder sense, um, as, as you might think about from, from a publicly traded company, I mean, owned by uh, a group of folks that um, are not trading their stock uh, openly. And this is what's called a public benefits corporation, and particularly in the United States, but it exists in Canada. And there are a number of different entities moving along those lines. I, I have to say, and also with the announcement from CMS, the interoperability announcement, while I don't have any fantasies that it's going to fuel a lot of um, innovative work immediately around health data exchange and, and open health data exchange, it certainly doesn't hurt to have CMS say those sorts of things. And, and even if the, the early bits are more driven towards compliance, I think it, what we're seeing today is it's, I, I dare say this, but it, it's going to be commonplace that we will have platforms and organizations that openly and uh, share their data, but also share uh, with the patients who provide the data, the people that provide the data, the, the, the chain of custody, where the data is going, why it's going, what the value is of the data. It's no longer a big mystery that uh, only EHR vendors and uh, payers uh, un understand. And I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give a shout out to a company that I think is is really doing a heck of a just a heck of a great job at taking that data and providing a lot of I'll call it usefulness, and that's a, a company called Humetrix. They're based out of Del Mar uh, in California, and it's it's just they've done a, a fabulous job of delivering ideas that really matter. Like, you know, are we? Are we, are we really, I don't want to you know, get too deep in the, in the COVID vaccine thing, but are we really providing and, and our vaccines and the opportunity to be vaccinated to the folks that may or may not be able to uh, avail themselves of that, the underrepresented uh, segments of the United States? I think if, you're, if you have money and you have access to healthcare, uh, you have this false notion that Oh, how hard could it be to get a vaccine? But maybe you're not a single mother um, working at night. Um, and Humetrix has done some really fabulous analysis of, of that on the behalf of the, the government and uh, some private entities. That's amazing. No, it's very, it's great to hear that, you know, this type of work and this data sharing and this using of public data to help, you know, further people's healthcare um, outcomes, that's, it's, it's taking a really strong hold in America and all across North America. So that's, that's great news to hear. So my next um, question is gonna segue a little bit more into advice um, and career um, tips and tricks that you may have. Um, you completed an MBA, which um, is quite valuable in the fields of healthcare management. And I just want to have, know if you have any advice for aspiring MBA students who wanna carve a future in the healthcare landscape. Because when you think of MBA, you think of finance, tech, economics, et cetera. But there's an actual very strong niche in healthcare um, that MBA people can use um, to like you know, leverage those skills and to like get a lot of potential in. And I just want to hear your thoughts on what those aspiring leaders can do to help you know, navigate and begin their careers. That's a, Senator Jim, that's a great, I think that's a great question because if I was gonna do my MBA over again, one, I would have paid a lot more attention uh, in statistics. And, and two, I would have looked for it would, have been, it would have been nice to have a class on uh, the quantitative methodology for risk management, and risk mitigation. And when I say that, what I, what I mean is we have uh, this, this tax on the system, if you will, um, in the provider space called revenue cycle management. And that's probably a little pedantic for me to say that, but 
it's a very, what I said before that this mystery around health data and how this works um, at the provider and the payer level, how these things get paid out and what gets paid out and why, and why claims get paid out. This is something that, that I think MBA students would want to focus on who are thinking about healthcare because we're going to get rid of that tax on the system. We're going to get rid of that middle layer. And, and, it's, and it's very numbers driven. It's very analysis driven. Um, and, and you really would do yourself a favor if you're either contemplating an MBA program or you're, in, you're you know, in the middle of it is think about how you could apply what you're learning and not just corporate finance or and and accounting, but in the way that claims are paid, the paying of claims today is very, very complicated. It shouldn't be that way, but it does require somebody that um, has a passion for numbers. So I think uh, the the opportunity in changing the insurance business is where if I was doing my MBA over again, I would pay, I would focus on that. No, I definitely agree with you on that, on that front. I hear a lot of clinicians, uh, especially in the States, I think it's a little different in Canada because of our universal healthcare system, but I hear a lot of American physicians complain about how they spend the equal amount of time delivering care as they do with haggling with the insurance company and getting paid for the care that they deliver, which, um, can be very redundant and can be very inefficient for the overall, the healthcare system. So I, I definitely agree with you. And that's, that's great advice to give those students um, who are watching this podcast to really like focus on that niche in their, in their studies and to take a keen interest in that. My next question is a little bit more about AI. And as a healthcare strategist, I want to hear your thoughts on where do you see the future of AI being used in strategy and management? <laughs> I see that smile. So I feel like this is a topic that's definitely come in your circles before. <laughs> oh, oh, probably uh, at least a half a dozen times a day. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, like everything else, uh, you know, it comes in two flavors. It comes as a buzzword and then it comes and hopefully more often than the buzzword, it comes as an actual plan. You know, what is it that we're going to do in healthcare when we get really good at pattern recognition? You know, and there's a lot of different, you already know, and I'm sure your listeners do, but there's a lot of different forms of AI. There's computer vision, there's machine learning, there's this idea, you know, and it's a derivative of, of machine learning, this idea of, um, you know, the neural network. So you've got decision support um, sort of sitting on the top of all of this imagery, words, um, and, and pure data from devices flowing into this, into these systems. And I, I'm not an expert on implementing AI, so I don't want to proffer myself as that, but I can tell you the big thing that you need to do to make AI work is you need to put together a lot, a, a large data lake, a lot of meaningful collated clean data. I think there's this general misconception that uh, you just point um, these uh, learning algorithms at a bunch of data and off you go. Um, those, those, those misconceptions are not something a data scientist would tell you, but certainly, you know, as, if you're thinking about this from a strategy perspective. So the first bit is you need to bring together data that's properly cleaned and collated and meaningful as it sits. That was a bit of a, a long haul up until recently with, you know, problems with interoperability and integration and um, exchange and so on and so forth, but in privacy and all those important bits. But again, we're in, we're in the golden era of, of health data now. We've got the right um, platforms. We've got the right thinking. We've got the right policies. I mean, there's a lot of improvement to be done, but AI is going to change the game completely. It's not going to get rid of clinicians. It's going to make clinicians a lot better. That really segues right into my next question perfectly. You mentioned that um, AI is going to get make clinicians better at what they do. But I want your opinion on what you think about management. Do you think AI will replace management or would it aid and provide stronger tools for healthcare managers' disposals? This is um, Michael Dillon's humble opinion, but I, I tend to think that based on experience that clinicians spend a lot of time 
doing uh, work that is not necessarily uh, something that's optimized for their skill sets. Um, a lot of data entry, a lot of manual um, uh, transcriptions of, of, of things. Um, and so freeing up time for clinicians to um, think about uh, the management of healthcare, I think it will uh, make them easier to manage, if, if I could say that. You know, it's, it's difficult to manage somebody who's spending their, their, a lot of their, their time um, doing something that uh, isn't particularly productive for, for anyone, but entirely necessary at this point. Once we get rid of that, then you've got, you know, you free up, you know, clinicians to, uh, you know, so they have an opportunity to, you know, participate in the healthcare system. And, you know, you see that in healthcare systems, you see uh, physicians, I have a couple of buddies that left their clinician, you know, and these are well-regarded uh, clinicians who left their practice because they felt like they can make a bigger impact as managers. Now, let's look at it a different way. Why don't you continue in your practice, continue staying in front of patients, continue doing what, what you do best and, uh, have an opportunity to participate in this. And so healthcare managers, you know, uh, who wants to manage? It's, it's the, the worst thing in the world is having to manage of a group of people who um, are just too busy to, to pay much attention to the, the, the plan that you're putting together. I think I agree with you. I think there are a lot of clinicians are stepping into the field of management, which, which is very beneficial, but I think we need to be also cognizant of the fact that they may not have some skill sets that an MBA graduate would have in terms of managing and leading like high business functions and whatnot. So I think the, the interplay between both the business economics and finance and all of that um, managerial side integrated with the clinical side, both of them bringing them together to help form like a management seat, seating table. I think that creates like the best function for healthcare organizations. Do you agree with that or you disagree? No, I, I agree. I mean, I happen to, my MBA program was chock full of clinicians okay. and they were, they were all to a, almost to a person, very self-aware of the fact that they had uh, missing, these missing skill sets. Um, and, and, and so I, I do believe it's, it isn't, it isn't just any more than I, I, I could pick up a, uh, and decide tomorrow after doing a couple of YouTube videos that um, I want to, you know, get involved in a bit of arthroscopic work, um, you know, repair a knee. Um, gee, it can't be that hard, right? I, I watched some videos. Um, it's all self-directed. Uh, I'll just, you know, call up Zimmer and ask them for a little tutorial. Um, it's, it's, it's involved. It's ex experiential. It's, you, you have a deep understanding of what these things are and why they work together. But again, it's bringing clinicians and managers together in, in a way that, you know, it's like a, a, you know, Venn diagram, you know, you want them to overlap more and right, uh, well, not right now, but leading up to this moment of technology, there's not been much overlap. It's, and, and neither party, um, and, and this isn't universally true, obviously, but there's a, there's a, a definitive uh, gulf between the two parties and that never makes for a pleasant or an effective environment. So I, I look forward to seeing how with new decision support systems fueled by AI, um, I think a trend towards um, a, a more harmonious and a more productive healthcare system, which benefits all of us. Yes, amazing. I, I love that. I love that last, that last piece that you just mentioned about how AI is actually bringing, not just integrating systems and technology, but also integrating people and ways of thinking uh, together. I just, I, I love that last remark that you just made. Uh, to kind of wrap things up, I just want to have if you have any last remarks on our viewers, um, on people who are interested in getting on the corporate side of healthcare and who have an entrepreneurial spirit. How um, do you navigate, you know, the public health system and you want to carve out your own business in, in that landscape? Any, any thoughts, any views, any ideas? Two things that I would suggest. One, do a deep dive on the provider side. Um, there's a lot of great program. I mean, not, I'm not advocating, advocating another, uh, another academic program, but the MPH uh, is in, in a lot. And there are programs. I know John Hopkins offers one where it's an MPH, MBA emphasis that kind of lends itself to what you were saying earlier. 
about um, what uh, sort of focus you might have in business school. But the other side of it is, and this is where I see a lot of uh, emphasis if I was, again, starting all over again, it's in the consumer side. We are, not only are we, we are entering a new age with health data, but we are entering a very, very exciting era with consumers and consumers becoming very educated, not just about wellness, um, but about health and about fairly sophisticated topics, um, you know, with diabetes management, really understanding what's happening from a physiological and, um, you know, technology perspective with a something like a continuous uh, glucose monitor. Um, you know, there are, there are huge groups and advocacies around this, and you could plant that on just about every acute illness on the, uh, on the planet right now. And so if you're an entrepreneur and you're thinking about getting into the corporate space, having an emphasis on consumer tech and a consumer approach will, I think, be very valuable. I mean, I don't want to name names here, but there's this little company that sells stuff on the internet. I think they're going to, it seems like they're going to do okay. It's named after a river um, in South America. And they, they, had a, they had a misstep, to be fair. Um, they, they, they went off and got Berkshire Hathaway and thought, you know, we're going to kill it and we're going to do this Haven thing. Um, and they didn't realize that, I don't care who you are, uh, you, good luck uh, sashaying into your, uh, especially American hospital or American provider group and telling everybody you're going you're gonna to price everything. Now they've gone a different direction and now they're focused on employee benefits and large company benefits and uh, providing uh, a consumer experience for people that um, are either the, the company uh, is looking to reduce its healthcare costs and the people that are working there um, are going to get an incentive to do that as well. So this is a huge field and it's, it used to be if you were a consumer tech person, um, draw a big line in the sand and, you know, no, you, you couldn't be serious about healthcare. I mean, really, mm -hmm. if you were a consumer tech person, that is totally changing. Amazing. I think that's, that's a great way and a great message to end our, our podcast um, to give our viewers just an idea of the multiple fields in both business, healthcare, on the clinical side, administrative side that you could um, go into. So I would like to thank you for such an enlightening conversation. And um, hopefully our viewers really benefit and people who are going to go and pursue MBAs and business degrees, they'll see the potential and the different niches that they can explore when they're, when they're on that path. So I would like to thank you again for taking the time. To, to have this interview with me. <laughs> My pleasure, Synthogen, and, and uh, great, great podcast, great questions. Um, and uh, thanks for letting me take it in my favorite place, which is in the outdoors. Amazing, perfect, thank you. <laughs>